Hello, everybody. We are starting out the fall semester of 2022 here on campus at Gateway. Uh, this is web programming, and I, you know, so I told you guys right before this session started that I reserved the right to change the syllabus, and I already found a mistake. So, uh, interestingly, this course is called web programming now instead of web programming one. We used to have a web programming one and a web programming two, and now they've changed names to web programming and advanced web programming, but they're essentially the same classes. So one typo I will fix and update will be that. So this one will disappear here. Now, why I didn't see this when I created the syllabus, I don't know, but I, I'm just telling you, imagine that one is gone. This class is called web programming. Um, it is the first class, and I'm gonna say maybe as far as the first semester course goes, one of the more important ones you're gonna take if you're a web person because these are the fundamental web technologies. We're going to learn HTML and CSS predominantly. And uh, HTML is the language that we use to create what I call content and structure for a web page or application. And CSS is how we control styles and behavior of a web page. Uh, in later courses, uh, you will also learn a scripting language called JavaScript, which is the programming language of the web. Uh, we brush upon it here at the very end of the course, but we have a whole separate course dedicated just to JavaScript. And then when you get to all the other web courses, JavaScript kind of is peppered in all along the way, just as HTML and CSS is. So these are languages that are going to be used in any web page work that you're going to be doing. And they're considered critical um, fundamental languages. The beautiful thing about these languages are they're really easy to learn, actually. I would say it's more challenging to master them, but to be able to get something up on the screen, it doesn't take much. And it's, and you know what, it's kind of fun and rewarding. It's kind of why I got into it myself is because it was, basically it was just cool. You know, I thought, I'm like, wow, I put something on the screen. I didn't even try hard, you know? Uh, and then you get all sorts of ideas and want to get empowered with it. All right. Um, the, Class meets on Mondays, um, and we meet from 11.40 to 3.40 p.m. That is a pretty long class for the web program. Part of the reason for that is uh, the, the credit count for the course, uh, and then because it's a foundational course, we opt to spend more time in the classroom. So typically, if you take a, a web course in the program, most often you'll be in the classroom only two hours, and then two hours of the instruction is online. This normally, if we did all the contact hours in person, would be a six hour class or two days a week for three hours. Our decision is to run it for four hours, one day a week, just to make it easier to, to be here. Um, so we will cover a lot of stuff during that four hours. And I plan to use every minute of it, you know, because there's that kind of that there's that much material. It really is. Um, so plan on being here uh, every week. If you have some sort of situation, like I mentioned before, those of you face-to-face -face students, you can always zoom into the classroom. Uh, those that might be fully online students listening to this video in the aftermath, uh, also please keep in mind that you can also join those Zoom sessions. Uh, and I also invite those online people to come to the classroom. You know, So very rarely is that taken up, but you can see we have empty seats here and uh, they're welcome. I just ask that they, they email in advance. Uh, we're here in the technical building at the downtown Racine campus. This is the third floor. The whole floor is dedicated to the IT department. So every classroom here um, has a, a designation as to like what material we teach. So if you look across the hall here, and you guys can kind of see across, we have a classroom full of people studying in the computer support specialist program. So that's kind of like one of our hardware rooms. Uh, the next room down is our networking room. Uh, so networking and cybersecurity typically is taught in that environment. Uh, on this side of the hall, the west side of the hall, is where we have more of the general courses and software related courses. So web really fits into the software area. So we learn a lot of the same stuff that the software developers do. And you really, you're, you're gonna come out as both a web person and a software developer when you're done. And that's why the degree is called web software developer. And it all falls on under the 152 course area. Um, 
learn a lot of different programming languages and, and coding techniques uh, in these programs, by the way. Um, we're in room T304 here. I, I do generally like this style of room. When, when the monitors are working, they're not working right now, but when they are working, it's great because you know it's all around the room. You kind of can't miss the content. It's, it's a whole lot better than if you're in the room and, and it's just like one screen in the front. And if you happen to be sitting in the back row, you might not be able to see it. Right? And I'm never a fan of that. Um, I am, uh, aside from a web instructor and data analytics instructor, I'm also chair for the program here. Uh, so I oversee uh, all the faculty assignments and issues of all the other faculty in the IT department. Um, and so I'm, I often can answer a lot of questions that other people can't. You know, if you're, or there's an issue, I can kind of get you to the right place. So please keep that in mind. Um, my office and all the faculty offices, by the way, if you go down the hall and you take that left turn towards those west doors, there's a door right there and it says faculty offices. That's, that's where most of us have our, our space. The one thing I will tell you is that most of us don't spend a lot of time here. And this semester, I'm only on campus on Mondays, which is kind of weird, um, even though I have a, a very full-time uh, teaching load, but that, that's how much we are online. And that's, that's kind of how it is. The halls, are, I, I'd say, are a lot emptier than they normally would be like pre-pandemic, where maybe like at least half the rooms would be filled during the daytime. Uh, but what you should know about the web program, and this is really important, you guys are, are here uh, for a daytime section. In fact, it's morning, uh, well, lunch now, okay. Um, but the web program is predominantly an evening program. You know, so most of our classes, especially when you get to the tail end of the degree, will only be offered at night or online. So you guys should be aware of that. Um, so sometimes some of us instructors, you know, are very reluctant to have early morning classes. That's why this is an 1140 start instead of like an 8 a.m. Uh, because sometimes we teach till 10 o'clock the night before. You know, so that, that's one of the reasons. Uh, my phone number and email address are here. And I'm, I, I will tell you just straight up that email is generally the best way to re reach me because if you call my office phone and i'm not here most of the time you know i'm not going to be picking up if you do leave a voicemail though so if you you know if that's what you prefer to do it pops up in my email anyhow and i can listen to it and, and call you back um but generally speaking if you want to get a hold of me email is the, the preferred form of communication it might not be like maybe your preferred form of communication i know a lot of us you know, mostly text, you know, these days or use text apps or whatever. And I get that. I'm not a fan of doing school communications that way. Right? Um, all the announcements that we do, or whether it comes from our administration or from me or from Blackboard, all go to email anyhow. So you got to get in that habit of just checking your email. You know, I'd say at least once a day, you know, uh, more practically, it should probably be a few times a day, just in case there's a change to an assignment or you know, the school blows up or something like that. Um, you know, we had like those storms last night and uh, I was kind of thinking back to, uh, we have like these, um, and I don't, and maybe your advisors already did this for you. We have these like early alert systems. So like if something goes down on campus, you can get like a text message or an email or both uh, to let you know that, hey, campus is closed, right? And that's particularly useful in the winter. Uh, but also we've had situations where there'd be like tornado warnings uh, or, or something like that. So that's good to know. I was watching the news when I got up this morning and it was like, um, power's out, power's out, schools are closed. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, I better check to make sure we're open and we, we're fine, obviously, because we're here. Uh, but it, it got to the back of my mind that, you know, hey, I know that if we were closed, I would have got a text message. So always be aware uh, of that or to check your email. Um, I do have office hours and office hours are basically a time where I'm available for you to come in and meet with me uh, for this class. And I'll show you this on my, my schedule in a bit. Uh, I do office hours right before class. So I'm going to be getting here. Class starts at 1140. I'll, I'll be arriving here by at, at the latest 1030 every Monday. So if you want to come in early just to work on stuff or you want to come and talk to me or whatever, uh, you're welcome to come right into the classroom. You don't need an appointment. Um, if you have a specific concern, though, it's not a bad idea to let me know that you're going to come in, and then I'll reserve the slot for you. 
because it's first come, first serve. Uh, and sometimes the time does run out. Um, I will have a few different office hour slots. So that's not the only one. There's one also Monday evenings and one Thursday even, early evening that you can come to. Otherwise, hey, if I'm online, you send me an email, you're having a problem, we can just jump on Zoom, take a look at my screen, your screen, whatever, and figure it out. You know, um, And real practically, that's how IT people work now. Anyhow, everybody works remote. We, we do screen sharing and video calls all the time. We don't even think about it. Um, I, I always like to tell my students that when the pandemic kicked in, the whole school freaked out. All teachers freaked out, all students freaked out. It's like, man, I gotta be on Zoom. You know, it's like not comfortable. The web program's been doing it for over a decade. You know, whenever we would teach a class, we were always broadcasting our screen anyhow. And we always would link often, and you'll see this sometimes, the courses will be what we call stacked, where there's typically an evening section stacked with a fully online section. And the online students always have the option to either come to the classroom or come in on Zoom. And it's just a standard thing we do. Uh, not all of the IT programs do that. Uh, it's just normal for us. You know, so um, just another day at the office. Pandemic, no problem. All right, let's talk about the actual course now and uh, take a look at the course description here. And I know you guys can read that for yourselves. Um, but HTML and CSS, those are the two main things that we're learning, a touch of JavaScript at the end. Um, but we're also going to learn about all the important web technologies. Like, first of all, like, you know, how does the web work? You know, what's a browser or which browsers should we use and what tools come with those browsers? Uh, where do you learn this stuff online or where do you get information? Uh, what software tools do I need to do web work? And, you know, the, the real short answer on that one, by the way, is really very little. You know, it's actually surprisingly so. You can create web content with the most primitive of text editors and a web browser. And then, you know, if you have to upload it, maybe an FTP tool, right? Um, we will introduce all that stuff today. And hopefully by the end of the class, we're gonna start writing code today. So that's gonna be fun, right? So we, we don't wait. Um, uh, the other thing that we do, and it's become, I think, a pretty important part of the class, is that we have um, basically the FTP stuff, which is called File Transfer Protocol. We'll do that a little bit later today, too, which is the mechanism that we take. So if we create a file on our computer, we can move it up to a web server and let the world see it. Now, the beautiful thing is um, here at Gateway, we have our own web servers, right? So we have one that's uh, across the hall in the closet called Apollo. That's our old one. We use that mostly now as a backup and we let the other, we'll let the CSS people use the old one, right? You know, when they use, need to do database or Python or whatever. And then we have a brand new server called Prometheus, which is out at our Sturdivant Engineering Center in my rack of data servers. And if you, if you don't know where that campus is, if you know where the movie theaters are on 20, if you guys are familiar with that, and there's a big water tower for Sturdivant, kind of by the train station and stuff. Gateway is right underneath that water tower. And we have an engineering campus there, including a dedicated IT classroom and 3D labs. And it's pretty cool space. If you ever guys get a chance to go out there and visit, uh, highly recommend it. Uh, probably the highlight of the place is what we call the Fab Lab, where they have like a 3D printing lab. Re really cool space if you've never seen it. All right. In terms of the uh, the textbook, and um, I, I did notice, and I thought this was kind of interesting, I have two sections of this class. I went into the registration system, you know, self-service, and I looked up the course, you know, I did this kind of thing to, to find the book information. I don't know what you guys see on your screens, that like you probably get a class schedule and you click on the course, and it probably tells you, um, you know, what, what book you need, like pretty easily. For me, I have to go through this process that you're seeing on the screen right now. And when you click on your course, uh, the screen comes up and then it says bookstore information here at the bottom. And once again, I don't know if this is what you guys see on your screen, but this is what I see on my screen, right? And before I run a course, I always uh, come in here and click on this to make sure, okay, well, do they have a book listed so that people can buy it or know what to get? Um, 
And thankfully, okay, so for our section, it is in there, right? The two RMA. Uh, for the people, I think maybe in the 2W7A, originally it wasn't listed. And so then I get into a little bit of like, oh no, they, they didn't even order the book in the bookstore kind of thing. Uh, but since we're on the topic of, of the book, this is um, a well-written web book. We've been using it here at Gateway for a while, um, ever since I've been here, and that's quite a long time. Uh, it is currently on its 10th edition. You can get a hard copy if you want, um, or you can get an electronic copy. If you're looking for recommendation, right? And so I always kind of think about, like, is this a book you should buy or a book you should rent, or should I get a used one or should I buy a new one? I'm going to say if you need a hard copy, as long as it's in good shape, used is fine. That, that's my thinking. If it's if it's that much uh, cheaper, like right here, I'm looking. It says great value used, and it's the same price as brand new. Um, <laughs> all right, I, I I don't know, but the oh, I see that those are rental options, right? Uh, now, I might recommend that you actually rent an electronic copy of the book. It's, it's short-term access, so it's only for six months, I think, 180 days, I think looks out to be roughly that. Um, and it can save you a bit of money, right? But you do need to have the book, and the reason you need to have it is all the stuff that's in that book, we cover from cover to cover. Right? We go through the whole darn book, the whole, every page, you know, is important. Um, and uh, that's, you know, it's got the case studies in it. It's got all the information that I used to test you on. And so it it is a useful book, right? You know, what I always hated is when, when I would go to school, and I've been to a few different ones, where they would make you buy a whole list of books and you get to the classroom and they didn't even use half of them. I'm like, I just spent hundreds of dollars on books and I didn't even correct the cover. Right? Um, and I wish the teacher would tell you that up front. In this case, you know, I'm gonna recommend straight up that you rent or buy a used copy. One of the reasons that you might want to get an electronic copy, and this is just food for thought for all your classes, is when you get an electronic one, you get instantaneous access. You don't have to wait for it to ship. You know, um, I know that when this textbook was brand new and people were ordering hard copies, sometimes it would take two, three, four weeks to get the book, and it's like, well, the class is half over. You know, so just keep that in mind. Uh, you can get it directly from our bookstore. So if you want to walk down, do the traditional thing. Uh, and buy the hard copy or whatever, or the, the digital copy, you can do that down there too. Uh, you can just go right to the bookstore and do it. I will just very frankly tell you that uh, the bookstore will take your financial aid dollars, outside vendors won't, but outside vendors can, you know, often uh, save you some money, you know, if you shop around. Um, in the old, and just another fair warning thing, in the old days, it was really easy for people to pirate textbooks so you would like find like pdf copies of you know the book for free out there please be very wary of that sometimes those free pdfs come with payloads these days uh in the old days it wasn't really like that but now the people that are going to the trouble of baking it are either dropping like malware or spyware or whatever into them uh so if if you're in the know and you're finding something not so legal, make sure you scan it for, yeah, PDFs can have viruses in them because they can carry code. You can code in a PDF, so um, just be very wary. But you do need the book, you know, long, long and the short of it. Uh, just, yes, Eve? What, what two books do you see? Okay. And E, now you're going to have me go back in there and look. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. All right. So, you know, that's actually um, kind of a good point. And, and, you know, I should have scrolled a little bit. So, this text, I didn't think it came from Pearson, but I think what this is, and Pearson does this, and Cengage does this. So, if you ever have a, a book that's published by Cengage, very popular for IT books. Like if you're taking the Java class also this semester, that uses a Cengage book. And basically those two publishers offer this system where you pay a subscription for the semester and you get access to all their books. You know, so that's what that is. Oh. I didn't I didn't think that this particular book was Pearson. Um, 
but you know what, maybe it is, maybe, you know, maybe like a sub publisher, you know, so if they're listing here, that's probably the case. So maybe this is your best option. So if, especially if it's digital, you can go to their website and you can like find a book on, on whatever you like and down, Hey, go for it. Yeah, it, is a it is a Pearson. Okay. Thank you for, uh, for uh, verifying that. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Right. So yeah, they're doing that with instructors now too. So if we want to look at our copies of the book electronically, we have to go to the Pearson website, but that's probably the better deal, right? I mean, it's cheaper than the rental and the purchase, right? Uh, e, thank you for pointing that out. Cause you know, that's what happens when you don't scroll all the way down. Sometimes you miss content. All right. So, uh, Interesting side note about this this book. Um, the author is a Wisconsin person, and you will notice that like when she does like case studies and stuff, that she'll use like Wisconsin place names, like their county or you know that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, so she lives right up the road from us. She writes a great book, uh, and I think she does a really good job of of writing. Uh, so this will happen in IT. You'll buy textbooks, and they're really dry, hard to read hard to absorb. I think this is actually a pretty readable book if you guys haven't tried reading it yet, uh, but you will discover that. Uh, if you happen to come across an older edition of a textbook, like if you're buying used or something like that, I'll, I'll say that you can use the eighth or the ninth edition. The material is basically the same. The case studies are a little different, but I know what they look like because I taught them. So you're okay if you bought an older edition as well. If you're doing that Pearson subscription thing though i mean that seems kind of like a no-brainer here to me right so all right oh uh required materials um we'll we'll get into this when we get into the course but basically some sort of modern computer system right you have to have something at home and you have to have internet access absolutely uh a bunch of different web browsers you know not just google chrome or not just safari or whatever you know your browser is um we will use predominantly straight up text editors or what we call IDEs. We will do a little bit with image manipulation. Uh, you know, we don't really like force you to buy Photoshop or anything like that. So we usually use operating system native you know, image editors, which are usually enough for web work, by the way. Um, FTP software, which uh, we should be introduced to today. And then it's always kind of a not a bad idea to check what your stuff looks like on a phone or a tablet, right? Um, mostly for the reason that most web surfing now happens on mobile devices, more so uh, than on desktop or laptop computers. <laughs> yeah, even, even Microsoft now <laughs> doesn't put Internet Explorer, like if you go to Windows 11, there is a way to kind of pull it up. And on Windows 10, you still kind of can. You have to you have to force it. Uh, yeah, but you know, um, Vidal, we had kind of an interesting situation that happened right before the semester started. Maybe some of you already know about it. If you had classes last week, um, we walked into the labs here, and on the student stations, the only web browser available was Edge. Oh my God! You should hear the the cries across campus because you know all the staff use Chrome. We're a Google shop. We have all the Google services. We have all the Microsoft services too, but it's it's really a support issue because it's it's a lot of work to do updates on all the various browsers, right? So if you have like Chrome, Firefox, and Edge, you got to update all three all the time, right? How often are the updates? Daily, weekly, every other day. So that's a lot of work for the techs, right? So they made this decision to just use Edge because Edge can be kind of broadcast updated where uh, the others not, can't necessarily. Um, but from a web standpoint, what's the most popular browser? You guys even know? Like what browser do you guys use? Right? Just about everybody uses Chrome as, as a go-to. Uh, in, in the web world, a lot of people use Firefox, by the way, because Firefox is, comes from the original browser code base. It's also a separate code base than Chrome. So it operates a little bit differently. And it is more standards compliant. And if you've given up on Firefox, I might encourage you to re-examine that tool. It does have better web developer tools built into it than Chrome does. Chrome is really good though too, right? So I'm not knocking it. But we're not so hot on Edge. So we were told, 
oh my God, only, edge only. I'm like, well, I don't worry because I carry my own gear, right? A lot of you do too, so you can control that. Uh, but when you're in the classroom, you want to be aware. <laughs> It is, it is the same thing. Mozilla is, is the kind of like the parent organization that runs Firefox, but the Firefox code comes from that original. And so once again, strange little connection to Wisconsin, the guys that originally came up with the Netscape browser, and before that it was called Mosaic, right? That code base uh, was developed by Wisconsin guys down in Illinois when they went to school there. And then that grew into Netscape and Netscape grew into uh, the Mozilla browser, whatever they called it in between. And then it became Firefox, but it's the same code base, but it is a different code base than all the other browsers, right? So this is, it makes it a little bit unique. Um, Chrome, Edge, Brave, I'm trying to think of Safari, all of those use the Chromium code base is what, is what it's called. Um, so Google writes the code, they all take it, tweak it, put their own face on it, but it's all the same browser on the D. Interesting, right? Um, in terms of what we're going to learn in this class, now this is the course competency list. This is kind of like the, the 10 mile view of the things that we teach to. Um, but let's get to the part where, you know, most students usually have concern. It's like, all right, so how do I earn my A? you know, and become a professional or whatever, right? Um, well, first thing is, whenever you're signed up for a class like this where you're face-to-face, -face, you're expected to come, right? If that, and I'm just putting it out there, if that doesn't work for you, right, you should always remember, next semester, you can sign up for online, right? Um, you know, so just please keep that in mind. But since you signed up for a face-to-face, -face, I don't formally take attendance, but I do take note. So I, I'm kind of like, you know, Hey, uh, Daniel's here every time, and, and Daniel came in extra early, and I, I told him, you know what, if I was a, if I was an employer, you're hired, you know, because you came in extra early. That's awesome, right? That's usually a good sign. Um, I'm not slighting any of you that came in late. I, you know, it's first day, whatever. You know, we didn't really do anything heavy, uh, but try to be here, right? If you can't be here in person, you know, this is for my face-to-face -face people. Email me and let me know. Hey, heads up, I don't have a sitter this morning, or whatever. Uh, I got COVID. <laughs> you know, that's still happening, right? Um, stay at home and jump on Zoom. But don't miss class. I, as a, as a general rule, like right now I'm recording this, right? I'm not one that always records every session like some teachers because, and here's the why, I already have it all recorded often. And unless my recording is bad or material is updated, I usually don't regurgitate it because it's the same stuff over and over again. Some, some of it's a judgment call, but, but typically if it's something new, I'm going to record it or the recording's already there in, in this class. All right. Uh, so show up. That's a really good thing. Uh, showing up, doing your work, communicating, just kind of being here. That earns you participation points, by the way. And participation points account for 15% of your grade. The reason I chose that number is because originally you know, when we started here, uh, well, I started here like nine years ago, we would have 15 week semesters. And then when the pandemic kicked in, they decided to make it 14 week semesters. So now we're down to 14 weeks. And I don't mean to freak you guys out, but because the semester started on a holiday, our class is only 13 weeks. You know, so we're kind of a little bit condensed. My online group's already been going for a week. Isn't that interesting? Right. So we have to move a little bit faster than they do to cover all the material. Don't freak out. We have plenty of time. I've done courses like this in much shorter amounts of time. Um, so it's totally doable. Uh, 13 weeks is pretty good. Uh, I will let you know that with the assignments and their pacing, right, the, the, the due dates are pretty gentle at first. But as we kind of move into the meat of the course and get past midterm, those due dates come hard, fast and quick and often. Right? So you're going to have to get kind of into a workflow of doing the work, but don't worry, I'm here to help you. Right? So that, that, that's the good part. Assignments account for 75% of your grade, um, and then exams are 10%. So I have a, a midterm exam and a final exam, each worth uh, 5% of, of your total grade. Now, just a little word about how I issue points. 
Um, e, you've been in class with me before, so you, you know my system. Uh, I use what I call a 100 point system. So that means that in the class, there are 100 total points available. If an assignment is worth 5% of your grade, like the, the midterm, it's a five point midterm, right? If it's um, like our FTP assignment, I think is maybe the first one is maybe like two points, that's 2% 2 of your grade. And the reason I use it is really easy to do calculations. So like if you were like, you know what? I'm not gonna do the midterm. All right, well, the best grade you're gonna get then is a 95 because that was five points. You know, you can still get an A potentially, but not a good idea. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it really makes it easy to calculate the grade. There's no weird conversions, nothing is weighted. You know, you'll go to some classes and every assignment will be 100 points or 200 points or some weird value like that. And then they use a multiplier against it to figure out how much impact it has on your grade. And usually what happens is you have no clue what it's worth, right? You know, just kind of the teacher's word. Or if you're a math geek and set up a spreadsheet, you can figure it out. Um, but I like the point system because it's really clear. So if you get to the end of the course, you know, you can just look at how many points you have earned. You put it up against this grade scale and go, oh, hey, I got 88 points. I got a B plus. That's great. You know, I, I can live with that, you know. Um, but the reality in the IT programs and, and welcome to higher education here in high school, you know, you give D minus in a class. It's like, all right, you're good. You can move on <laughs> here. You got to get a C or better. So if you don't get a C or better in this class, you're going to retake it. That's just the reality. To get a C, you need to get to 74 points, you know, and that's an IT department policy. So you might be able to take a gen, gen ed course like English and get a D and that'll count. But in the IT courses, it's C or better. When you move on to a four year, if you guys ever do that, and I really sincerely hope that you do, because that's a smart move, it gets even harsher, right? You, you get, you know, they'll, some schools have like a C standard, some will have a B standard, and then you get to like master's level work and they basically only take A's, you know? Um, but here's, here's the funny thing, by the time you're at that level, I mean, you got school figured out, you know how to do it and you, and you do it, you know, because you, you see the benefit of it. You guys are yet to see the benefit of school, but I will tell you from my own personal experience of what I've seen in the world, people that go to school in the long run will do better than people that don't. It's not that you can't do well without school, but if you just look at the statistics of it, you will make more money, you will be happier with your path of employment, you're much more likely to have a single income household where one income can support the whole household instead of having two. Or if you get two people earning great incomes like that, I mean, fantastic, right? And then you're middle class. Welcome to paying bills, right? <laughs> um, but school is worth it in the long run. So get to those grades, uh, and if you're ever struggling, you know, um, we'll talk about this in depth too. Um, just always remember, I'm here to help you. Um, you can always form study groups with your peers. That's another thing you can do. And you can go to our tutoring center, which is in the first floor of the Lake building here in Racine, uh, and meet with the IT tutors. And the IT tutors, I don't know if they're on site. I think they're on site. Um, these days, in the, in the, during the pandemic, they were never on set, they were only on Zoom, but I think now you can do either one. Right? Um, I'll show you how to, how to do that. Uh, at some point, I usually invite one of the tutors to class just to say, hey, like, hello. Uh, and they're really cool people. Most of them, uh, I think the two or three that we have now, I think all of them are former students. So they've all gone through these programs and they know the classes, they know us as instructors. They don't do the work for you. They help you with the process of doing the work. And if you're struggling at all, um, it can make a really big difference, you guys. All right, exams and quizzes. We have two exams. Uh, I don't have any quizzes in the course per se. Um, the midterm exam happens uh, the week leading up to October 21st. Um, and then the final exam happens during the last week of class. Okay, just. Uh, eye opener here. We don't do tests in class. You won't come in on October 21st and sit down and do your midterm. You do your tests on your own time. My classroom time is to teach, you know, so that's how I operate. So I also give you a one week window in which you can do your test, right? 
Uh, if you miss the due date, just by the way, because this sometimes happens, let's say you miss the due date on your midterm, it doesn't turn off, you can still take it, and there's no point reduction, right? It's just a matter of if do you want to count, to count towards your midterm grade or not. So I don't really penalize you if you miss it or miss the due date, right? The tests are open note, open book, um, open internet, phone a friend. You know, I can't really stop you, right? Some instructors will go as far as using what we call a lockdown browser for a test. And you find this typically more in like a math class or something, right? Where they bring up a browser and you can't like use anything else on the screen thinking like, well, well duh, everybody's got a phone. They can just look it up on their phone. Right? So my, my approach to tests is not to make them super difficult. It's testing basic knowledge from your readings. My hope is when you take them, like, oh yeah, we talked about that. This is the answer, you know, and you, and you just know it, right? Um, so you won't find that they're particularly difficult. Uh, they are timed. Yes, yes, they are timed. Uh, one thing that, you know, I, I've done, Vidal, also, that's a good question, is usually what I do is I engineer my tests where I think they should take about a half hour. That's kind of my, my target. I realize some people will look everything up and it might take them like an hour, right? So I... What I do is I take what I think the longest time is, and then I double it. So then usually it's a two hour window to take the test. Uh, when we get close to the midterm, I'll talk about all this stuff once again. Um, but it's nothing to stress about. Um, you know, the, the tests really aren't that hard. They're not a huge part of your grade here. More of what's a big part of your grade is all the other stuff that you do in between the actual coding, you know, stuff that we're here to learn. Um, another really important thing to kind of keep in mind here is there um, the, kind of like, you know, one of the reasons that you come to a technical college is because a technical college, unlike a four-year institution, when you go to a four-year institution, you know, it's like, what's all that four years about? It, what it is, is a whole lot of general education often before you get into the stuff you really want to learn. So you might go to school for a year or two and then get into a coding class. In technical college, it's not that we don't have gen ed courses. We do have English and math and sociology and whatever and econ. But we get right into the coding immediately because our mission as an institution ever since we started is to train people to take the jobs that are available in our own district, right? So the reason we exist even as a, a degree program is because there are employers in Racine, Kenosha, and Walworth County that will hire you for what you are about to learn. And those employers sit on our advisory board and suggest to us what skills they need their employees to have so that they can hire them. It's a lot different than a four-year school. Very, very different. So our mission is to train you to take those jobs. The other thing that you're going to see that's really significantly different between a four-year and a two-year is that a four-year is typically taught by academics. Now, I'm not citing them because I'm an academic, too. I went through a lot of schooling to get to where I am. In fact, I did uh, an associate's and a bachelor's in business before I'm like, I don't want to do business. I want to do computers. And then did a bachelor's in, in computers, too. And then went on to do a master's degree, right? And it's like, oh my God, that's a lot of school. But it goes really fast, you guys. It, it seems like it's like a long time when you're doing it. But the academics have something that we don't have here at Gateway. So when that, I came here to get a job at Gateway, they looked at my academic and just said, great, you got all the degrees, but can you actually do the work, right? So when you're hired as an instructor here, you're hired with, I, I think it was like 10,000 hours of occupational experience in the subject that you're teaching. So if you're taking a class with Jerry in the computer support area, he used to run servers for the Follett Corporation, which runs all the bookstores and stuff. He knows his stuff. He worked in the field. So you're getting it from people that really have done the work. All of us web instructors have worked in the field. We've created web pages, applications, mobile apps, games, yada, yada, yada. We've done it, and we're still doing it, honestly, all of us are. And uh, you can go to a four-year, it's not that they're not smart, not that they can't teach you. Some of those people have never worked in industry. Really big difference in, in, in how that translates. Now, what does that mean for you as, as a student? We know the value of work 
and employers know the value of work and what they're really looking for in a hire is somebody that's going to show up come early right show up and do what they're assigned to do and that's kind of how we teach so when we have an assignment out there you have to do it to earn the points and you can think about it like earning your paycheck right so that that's a little bit it get, takes a little bit of getting, getting used to I, you know because i know especially if you're coming right out of high school what happens is high schools now um and i know this because both of my kids recently graduated or within a few years they don't really make you do work they kind of just push you through the system it's like oh, you, you did okay on the exam you just go on you know you're graduated you're fine right and then they come here and it's like what do you mean i have to turn in the homework yeah if you don't turn in the work you're, you're gonna fail right well i can't turn it in late well sure if, if you want to lose points you know so this part of this syllabus is, might be the most important part the late work policy so generally speaking when i put an assignment in blackboard you'll click on it it'll have a due date and a point value the goal is to turn it in before the due date right so you want it, so if you don't want to lose any points so typically for example on a class that's a monday class like this i will have stuff for you guys to do for next week and then the due date will be two days after our session and i do this on purpose some instructors will make it before the session i like to do it after because then you can come to class ask questions work through the issues make your fixes and turn it in and still get all your points if you miss the due date, so it's like a day or two or three late, then you will start seeing the points come down a little bit. It's not really a lot though. So if you're a day or two late, don't freak out, still turn it in, you'll still get points, probably most of them. In some cases, I might not even deduct points. You know, it's kind of a judgment call. So for example, for next week, I probably have some assignments that are due uh, on Wednesday at midnight. Do you think I'm sitting there at midnight on, you know, Thursday morning at that point, waiting to grade your work? I mean, let's get real, right? Maybe the next morning and probably not, but I, I consider that a little bit of flux time. So it comes in after midnight or the next morning, whatever, that's on time to me, right? So I'm pretty reasonable about it. Um, if you're not making as much progress as you want on something, but you have been working on it, what you can do is you can exercise uh, this third bullet here, which is turn in what you have so far. Show me that you're working on it and say, I'm not quite done yet, but here's what I have so far. You get one extra week to work on it. No point reduction, right? Without a penalty, but that's provided you turn something in on time and let me know that it's only partially complete. If it happens to be more than two weeks late, that's kind of when the hammer comes down a little bit the most you're gonna get is half the points. So every once in a while I get people for whatever reason, you know, work, life, whatever, you know, I'm not, I'm not judging, it just happens that wait till the end of the course and then try to turn everything in. You have to be a, like a math genius to figure out if you're only getting half the points on everything, it doesn't really work out that great, you know, you're usually struggling. Um, so in that case, what you might wanna think about is doing some of the extra credit stuff that's in the course, because that can boost your score without hurting you. Um, if I see that you're that that's a pattern that you're falling into, I try to communicate with you and let you know, hey, you know, let's need some help, uh, what's going on. Um, and if you have some legit reason for like things being light, um, you know, I, I've got all sorts of interesting student stories of like people who have like tragedies happen in their life. And I don't wish tragedy upon you, but things happen, right? Car accident, snowstorm, house catches on fire, sickness, uh, sick children. That happened to one lady within one week's time, by the way, one of my students. Totally great student, but of course it threw her off, right? Um, let me know, right? I, I'm reasonable. You know, if you got something going on, we'll work it out, you know? Um, but I can't work it out if I don't know. Right? And you don't have to like announce in class, hey, I'm dying <laughs> or something like that. Um, we can you know, step aside or do it by email or whatever. Um, the only real hard deadline here is last day of class at midnight, right? Uh, so Monday, December 5th at midnight, I won't accept any more stuff because I go into grading mode and then I have my own deadline of 
within 48 hours of class end to post grades. Usually what I do is class ends, the next morning I'm posting grades. So they gotta kind of be kind of like a model for our department here. All right. So if you don't remember these, I'll, I'll kind of re remind you of those as we go. I also have this goofy little thing, which is the get out of homework free coupon, kind of goofy. I borrowed it from somebody when I first started here and I'm like, you know what, this is kind of nice, you know. Um, you can, so if, here's a scenario. Hey, I got this uh, case study I'm doing. Man, I'm just like so behind and work is like pushing me really hard and the Packers are playing or whatever. I'm losing horribly or whatever. Um, and I didn't get the assignment done. I'm just gonna take this coupon, I'm gonna throw it in. So you, you screenshot the coupon, submit it in place of the assignment and you got two points. You can only use it once. Kind of a safety net right i will remind you towards the end of the course um, and you can read the instructions right there now if you turn it in for a five point assignment you still only get two points the two points are better than no points it might be the difference between like one grade and the next so um all right all right so some of my grading policies and you guys will see this as i as i get rolling um I mean, I don't think any of you have had me before except for E. In E, you know, I, I, I tend not to be really punitive in my grading and like people to get things right. So let me explain what I mean by that. So like ideally, let's say you have a case study or a coding assignment, um, you know, where you have a certain task to complete and you turn it in. And even though it's on time, you didn't really quite do it right. You, you messed something up or maybe the link that you sent me isn't working or something like that. Typically what I'll do, especially if it's on time, is I'll say, okay, we'll go back in there and fix this part because it's not right. You take a look at my example or uh, fix the link and resubmit it and you get all your points, right? So my goal isn't to like punish you. My goal is to get you to succeed. I wanna see you do it right. Um, and here's the reality in IT and why I have this philosophy in IT. How often do you try to do something on the, on the screen, mess it up, but it doesn't mean that you're not gonna figure it out and get it right eventually and be an expert at it. Right. So just because you messed it up the first time, that might be completely normal. In fact, I will tell you, I think it is highly normal as part of like what IT people do to to always, oh, I have a problem. What am I going to do to fix it? Okay, well, I fixed it. Right. You shouldn't be judged on your first attempt that failed. You should be judged on the one that succeeded. That, that, that's kind of my approach. That that's something you should know up front. So very often particularly if you're on time with your work, I will give you the opportunity to fix it and make it right and get over it. All right, uh, let's talk about the key dates here. Um, so we start here on September 12th, um, actually the second uh, week of uh, classes in the fall. It's kind of a late start date. Some day, sometimes we start in August for the semester. We end on December 5th. Uh, if you guys are continuously going to school, that means we have a really nice long holiday break, you guys. It is wonderful, right? In the old days, we'd have like the week of Christmas and a little bit of New Year's and we were back, you know? And now it's like we get almost, I think it's almost a whole month and that's just wonderful in the wintertime and the holidays are happening. Everybody's busy and snow's flying. Uh, so that's a, that's a great thing. Um, the fact that you guys are all here, if you're on financial aid, you've already cleared the financial aid census date. Um, it's just basically <clears throat> making sure people show up to the sessions um, and are trying to scam for money or, or whatever, and I don't anticipate that. Um, if you guys want to voluntarily drop the course and still receive some portion of a refund, you have until the 26th of September to do so. And I think if you drop by that date, you get like 60% of your money back or 50% of your money back or something like that. So you can get kind of a partial refund. Um, if for whatever reason you guys aren't very active in class or showing up or turning in work or communicating, I have a one week period that I can drop you. So that goes from the 27th to the 3rd of October. Uh, I very, very rarely and think only once or twice have used that. So I don't, you know, and you guys are already fine because you're all here. So uh, midterm grades post on the 21st of October um, by end of day. I usually try to, you know, post them the Saturday after that lapses. So the 22nd, you should be able to see your midterm grades. Um, and then if you want to voluntarily withdraw from the course, 
um, you have until the 15th. And, and if you're wondering, what's the difference between a drop and a withdrawal? It's the impact on your transcript. So a drop really is kind of uh, really a way to get money back. A withdrawal is putting a W on your transcript as opposed to a letter grade. So let's say like you're taking this course, it's a train wreck and you're not gonna pass, you know, or you know, no judgment for whatever reason, right? By that date, you can withdraw, you get the W on your transcript that has no impact on your GPA. It will get replaced by the actual grade once you retake the course, and then that impacts your GPA positively. Um, and the reason I, I point that out is if, let's say you're off course and, it, and you think you're gonna fail, and you do nothing about it, then you will get an F on your transcript, and that has a significant negative impact because it's a zero. You know, on the GPA, it's not good. So take the W instead of the F. It's kind of the, the rule of thumb there. Um, the next little piece in here, and this is kind of the last major content piece in the syllabus, and then we'll we'll be just about done here uh, with this, is our calendar and points. And so when I put this stuff into Blackboard, one of my more time consuming pieces really is figuring out when everything is due. So I kind of like go through it in my head and the calendar and figure out how much time we need for everything. Uh, and these are the due dates that I planned uh, as of well, last night when I put the syllabus together. Um, and for the most part, th this should stay true, right? There might be times where I'm like, well, you know what, we need a couple more days on this one or uh, we're moving faster, so I'll leave it alone. But this should be really close to accurate for the whole course. Ultimately, the only way you really know the due date is to look at the actual assignment itself in Blackboard. Like, click on it, open it up, and it says this is the due date in time. Most everything is due at midnight. The one exception is the final web project. Uh, so we'll do a pro we'll make a website at the end, and we need to present them in class. We're going to do show and tell, basically. Uh, and in order for that to work, you have to have the website done, you know, before the end of the last class. So the due date's kind of like, I think I said it for like one o'clock on that last Monday, and then the last part of class we we actually take a look. Um, all the point values. Remember, I said 100 points total uh, are broken down here, so you can see how that uh, breaks down assignment by assignment. Uh, and I think that's really helpful to know in advance like, how you're going to be graded. So every, you know, so a five point is 5%, uh, the three points, 3%, really easy to calculate. All right. uh, the last little section here is uh, college policies and resources. And in, in the past, we used to build all this stuff into the syllabus. Now they got smart. That's a link to the student handbook where all the policies are present. You guys should read that and check it out some good information in there. But if you have any questions about any of it, I'm always happy to answer as best I can. Uh, I do know a lot of it uh, by heart. So now that we've gone all the way through the syllabus, what I would like you guys to do is, now you can do this either through unit zero, or you can go down to the uh, discussion board directly. And there's a syllabus acknowledgement discussion board. And you click on, that link and e thank you for doing a, a perfect example for us what you do is you come in here and you create a thread so you click on this button up here at the top it doesn't quite look like a button but it is if you hover so you click that and then you can you, know, you, you don't have to title it anything fancy you can just say syllabus you know or whatever right and then uh, type i have read the syllabus and understand. And then if Vidal, if I want to get sarcastic, I will obey. <laughs> so when you're done typing it in, uh, just hit submit down here at the bottom and it will post. Um, and what I what I tell everybody is that I won't grade any of your work in this class until you've done this task. And you know what you earn a point, I think, for just doing this. So one point down, 99 to go. Right? Hopefully we'll get a few more earned today. I mean, showing up kind of earns you a point too, so that's good. 
All right, any questions on the syllabus at all? Where to find it? Okay, I did notice a couple of little typos and stuff. I am gonna be going back and fixing and I would just silently fix them and re-upload it. Um, but that's where you can find it if you ever need to refer to it. Um, what we'll do right now is we've been here for an hour already. You guys feel like that time burning, right? That's one, one hour already in the can. We're gonna do a five minute break. So the recording is gonna end here. Uh, right now it's uh, 12.51, let's call it 12.52 and come back at 12.57-ish, all right? See you guys in five.